Good evening YouTube. Today we're going to have a, a different sort of talk. Um, so a few days ago, like last week or something, I had this weird ch quit Twitter exchange where some people don't really understand uh, the relationship between group differences and uh, individuals and particularly the inferences you can make and cannot make uh, between them. And so we've made this, this small presentation here. And so we have these kind of tweets where we have uh, some kind of Helen Pluckrose, who's some kind of um, anti-woke philosopher type, and she's, you know, continuing to make a sort of point that group differences are uninformative uh, about individuals, and um, she even says that they explain nothing, tells us nothing about any individual, which of course is uh, statistically incorrect. And so I reply with the typical Emil uh, reply, which is that it's just false, and that they should stop repeating this particular claim. Um, Charles Murray, he weighs in, so Charles Murray, uh, of course, knows that statistically speaking, I'm correct, but he still feels that it's okay to, to err on the side of caution with what you can infer and what you cannot infer. And uh, I disagree. I think uh, there's a lot of problems in, in everyday reasoning and even a lot of like social science uh, research, uh, especially about stereotypes that's completely nonsensical because they keep ignoring this fact that there, there is indeed some things you can infer. Hence this video. So um, Helen uh, Pluckrose there, um, she uh, in fact disabled her YouTube, uh, not YouTube, uh, Twitter account for a few days following this. I guess uh, she didn't want to deal with this fallout. Uh, I don't have any problems with, with Helen, not her normal work or nor, nor her behavior in this regard. Uh, I said nothing bad about her and she said nothing bad about me, or at least as far as I know. Anyway, we have this other person, Iona Italia, who is some uh, boomer cat lady. And uh, she is very unhappy, uh, something about this stuff. So it's both uh, the creep and blah, blah, blah. She cannot really understand. She thinks I'm subhuman. I mean, what is wrong with this woman? Whatever the case, uh, you can see where things usually go from this. Uh, if they go this sort of place. And so we're going to be happy to talk a little bit more about statistics. And so uh, on this uh, on this page, you can find the output of my simulation. And we will, for a change, look at the actual simulation in this case. And so here we have our, our studio. And so we will load the packages and stuff. Um, then in the first simulation, we're going to be simulating some data here. This is some simple data where we have two groups called the blues and the greens. So they cannot offend anyone unless you uh, consider these uh, colors to be linked to someone. I don't know which colors you like. Maybe they're sports teams. Um, as we can see, we have some variable that's just called value. And it could be whatever you want. I've given it a total nonsensical value of mean of 52 with some standard deviation. And the two groups, we see that the the blues have a lower value than the greens for whatever reason. And if we plot this, we get a typical bell curve or a typical bimodal bell curve sort of situation where uh, we see indeed that the greens uh, have a, a hard, higher mean. And if we do a different plot, we can do this kind of violin plot. So obviously, uh, the critics will say this is kind of the distribution of the blue people and they can fall anywhere, you know, and in theory, they could fall anywhere on this y-axis. But in practice, they are very likely to fall somewhere in this region. And so uh, if we all we know is that they're blue, we don't know a lot about them, but we do know more than nothing. For instance, they're very unlikely to be up here, whereas the green ones are only slightly less unlikely to be up here. Uh, but these differences do matter. And if you make inferences about people, and especially when you have measurement error and uncertainty and so on, th these things are important. And so we can see this statistically if we fit some models. And here we fit a linear model where we try to predict the value of a person given their group membership. And we can see that in this case, we get an, uh, an R square value of 2.2, which means that 20% uh, of the variance is explained here. And that's the value you get when you have a standard deviation or a, a Cohen's D of 1, you know, one standard deviation gap between these groups or, or approximately there. And so if we also fit a model with no group, of course, this model explains nothing uh, since it's just the intercept. The intercept is, is just the mean, the overall mean. And so we can also plot these model predictions and they look like this. So if we take the 
the model that has the group means. Uh, we have the expected value. That's you know the best prediction you can make for a given individual. It's about 50 and 55 because the greens have a higher mean. And so we see that the, uh, the confident interval here, which is the prediction interval, it has a predictive, it shows, you know, the 95% the uh, chance that a given green person be within this, within this range and for the blue ones over here. So immediately we can, of course, see that uh, in these regions where there's no overlap between the confidence or the, the intervals, uh, in this region, it's very unlikely you'd find a green person there, although you could, it's just very unlikely. And the same case for a blue one up here. And if we just have a model where we just use nothing, we, we just assume the average value of humans or whatever these people are, and then we just get this and you do nothing. And one thing that's a little difficult to see here is that in fact the, the intervals here are shorter on this side than they are over here. And that reflects the certainty that you have about a, a given uh, person's or yeah, a given individual's uh, likely values or yeah, probable values. And so you cannot see it here, but we can see it if we make the, the gap larger. And so in the second case, we do exactly the same as the first, except now we make it a two standard deviation. So now we have 10 and, uh, or we have 10 points between, so 50 and 60, and the standard deviation should be about five, right? And so again, we can plot the histogram. We get this, now they're a bit more spread out than they were before. Right, and uh, we can also do the violin plot, which many people uh, think are better. And again, we can fit the models. And if we look at the model output, we see now that the the model explains half the variance, whereas before it was twenty percent of the variance. And um, down here, this model still explains nothing because it only has the the um, the overall mean. And if you have an only have an overall mean, you cannot explain any variation between. Uh, cases in a given data set. That's, uh, you have some kind of individual data to do that. Nevertheless, we see that this model is now more accurate than the one we had before. And we can simply plot that the same way we did before. And now we get this plot. And so it's very similar to before, except that we see now obviously that this, this range is a lot shorter than the green one over here. And that's the precision that you get now in this data. Is that in fact, you can say uh, that the given individual here is quite more likely to be in that range and over here you have a lot more uncertainty. So the, so obviously the the group means are informative about individuals because now we know a, a random picked green person is, is extremely unlikely to be down here and very unlikely to be here and the same thing for the blues up here. But when we only have the model where we ignore the group differences then we don't really know anything we just kind of they're about equally likely to be anywhere. And so the group differences are, are very, uh, in, in, this, they're, in this case, they're quite informative about the mean. If we're looking to, for uh, persons up here, and the only thing we know is the group membership, we know that we have a not very good chance, but about 2% two, two chance or so uh, with the green, but with the blue ones, there's, there's essentially no chance to get a person up here. Uh, that there will be one in a thousand or something less, maybe, um, whatever the values exactly come out to. And there's, again, no difference between this and having more groups. So this whole thing about having one group membership that you guess from, that's nothing, uh, in, there's nothing specific about this. This, uh, this fact is completely general, that if you have not one, but two groups, uh, in this case, we have the blues and the greens as before. And also I've added the age groups. So now we have the young, the middle and the old age people and they also increase in these, in whatever value it is that we're predicting. And so we can plot exactly the same as before, but now we split it, and we see that uh, for every age group, the, the, the blues are higher. And I think it's was the greens before, but you know, whatever. And um, if we then, if we then fit the, the models, um, we get the same sort of thing. So now we have two predictors in the model and we get slightly lower, uh, because I changed the kind of variance in the model. But you still get a pretty good uh, predictive model here. And of this one, of course, you predict nothing. So if we look at then the plots for a given person, if we have the model now that has, we have taken into account two different group memberships plotted by the different uh, dots here in the ranges, we know that 
Now that a, a given person, if we're looking for someone with a high value, uh, it could be an, an old, I think this is the old, uh, blue one, or, you know, it can be this one, or it can be this one, right? But even maybe this one could be okay. And so if we find a given person that's a different given place, it's very unlikely. And of course, the, the uninformative model, we're just guessing the same overall mean every time. And now these lines are also shorter than these lines. Again, indicating that um, we can make probabilistic judgments based on these two groups. And of course, then you can collect more and more groups. And that's what uh, collecting individuating uh, information is about, right? You keep, if you're interviewing some person, uh, all you're really assessing is you're collecting predictor variables about them. These can be group memberships. In this case, we have the age and the color, but you, you could add anything you want. You could ask, in, instead of the age it grouped into three, we can ask about continuous measurement of age, you know, in, in years or integer values, or you can, you can ask about any other thing. Um, and you keep adding them to a model and it keeps getting more and more certain for where a, a given individual is likely to be. So there, there is in fact uh, no such thing as as groups don't apply to individual or group averages don't apply to individual. That's completely nonsense. Um, pre the standard statistical treatment is predictive intervals and they show you know the likelihood of where a given individual is, is likely to be given their whatever information it is you have about them. And um, so if we return to uh, the presentation here, um, what we can really say is that, whoops, I'm going to make myself small here. Yeah, it, that uh, group differences, they do matter for individuals. And uh, in a normal situation, you can obtain more precise estimates of whatever it is you're trying to guess. In this case, we guess the value. And um, but if you want more uh, precise estimates, you can collect you know, more information about them. You can maybe find their Facebook and you can ask their friends or, you know, there's a lot of things to do. But in a real world, then you cannot collect information for free. Um, you gather, in practical terms, you gather information until you have enough that you're certain enough what the action should be. And so that's there's kind of a satisfying, uh, a satisfying thing to it that you collect information until it's good enough, and then you act on that. And this is the individuating uh, information in terms of, of, of social psychology. And you always have to ask, uh, act, act on limited information because uh, it would take infinite amount of time to, you know, collect enough information to never have any uncertainty. And so if we take uh, a simple situation, we have hiring. And let's say you are assigned to be uh, an HR person at some company and you have to hire people to fill these like five positions of some like clerks or something. And you get... 100 applicants, which is typically what large companies say, they open five positions, they get tons of applicants. And you don't want to spend forever hiring these people because these are low level or mid level workers. And so uh, having someone to keep doing lots of interviews, there's a diminishing returns to this. Some people are good enough. And so in this case, we say you've been given some number of hours. And so you decide that considering the number of applicants and the nature of this job, and then the number of time you have for this, you can't really interview all 100 people because you only have eight hours in this in this situation. So what you do is that you, you skim all the CVs and you pick the ones with the highest education because you think that um, education is is useful here and um, for this job, right? If, if someone can finish some university degree, uh, they can probably also fill out these, these books or whatever it is that they're supposed to do on this job. And so you, you pick the fair, you do a quick skim of their CVs, you pick the 15 best looking, you know, quick glance, maybe spend one minute for each CV or 10 seconds or whatever. And then you interview these 15 and then you high five them, right? That, that way you've kind of been economical. You made first a, a rough um, filtering of people and then you kind of dug into the, the most likely candidates. And this is perfectly reasonable, um, even though you, are, you, you know perfectly well that these this education that you used initially, it's not that predictive of job performance, um, but it's, it's good enough considering your constraints, right? And so, as we see that there are some people that, that really cannot understand this thing. Of course, averages don't apply to individuals, but that's just totally not true. Um, you can make a guess about a random person, but, but the, the statistics are never out the window, right? They always, they always matter, and so, uh, Whenever you have limited information, you have to act, which is 
very often in life, um, then you have to take into account the group means and the group differences. And in fact, this is what people do. And in economics, this is called um, statistical discrimination, right? You, you make uh, the appropriate action given the information that you had. So individuating information is really just adding more sources of data until you are certain enough that you it's good enough, whatever, right? And then there is really no qualitative difference between making a prediction about some person based only on one group or collecting a bunch of other data. Like this is simply a continuum between you know collecting more and more data until you're you're good enough, right? So with that said, I think these people have been debunked, and that's the end of this video.